Hi everybody, welcome back to Read and Reread. I am Angelia and today I'm doing the Yes Chef book tag. This is a really fun tag that was created just recently by Caitlin at Bandy's Books and I will include the link to her original tag video in the notes below. And I've seen several people doing this. I think the tag's only been around for a month or two. So if you like these questions, if this looks fun to you and you have a channel, consider yourself tagged. That's actually the last question, but I did it first. I am wearing a shirt for the occasion that you can't really see that says eating made easy with this fork and knife. And I have no clue what this shirt refers to because I thrifted it and I Googled it. You know, if I thrift something, it has some kind of graphic on it and I don't know what it is. I always look it up just to make sure it's not accidentally some, you know, chapter of the clan or something. So, but it is not. I don't know what this is. It didn't come up with anything. So I don't, I don't know if you know what this shirt was about, you can let me know. All right. I'm already digressing and I haven't even done the first question yet. So who knows what's going to happen in this tag. Have you ever read a book written by or about a chef? What was it and did you enjoy it? I have never read a book written by a chef. At first I was coming up completely empty on this question. I was thinking I've read plenty of books where there was a character who was a chef. Uh, even just recently I talked about signal fires last week and the, one of the characters becomes a chef. But then I, I don't know I was I was just thinking of shows like I love the bear and that was about a chef but that's not what the question was and then I remembered that a long time ago I did read Julie and Julia which was of course Julie Powell's, Powell's memoir about the year that she spent trying to cook her way all the way through Julia Child's uh, French cooking I think I have to look up the exact title it's like mastering the art of French cooking or something like that. I'll put it up here. And she went through and she made all these recipes. So it was a memoir about what was going on for her in her life at the time in the structure of uh, struggling her way through these recipes in a tiny kitchen in New York City. And I did, uh, I suddenly remembered that I did read and enjoy that book, even though it had so many gross recipes in it. And, you know, just to tell you right off the top, we're vegetarian and mostly vegan. And we can't claim to totally be vegans because we cheat and eat pizza now and then, things like that. But in in the cooking in our house, it's mainly, it's mainly vegan. And so every time, that's one reason why I haven't read a lot of chef books, because they're usually not vegetarian. And then there's elaborate descriptions of selecting and preparing meat. And, I, and I'm not interested. And so this book, though, had some old school stuff about making stock out of bones and all these kind of things. And the story was really funny in her search to find the right ingredients and materials, even though she lived in a, you know, of all the cities where you could probably find the things, but she still had a lot of struggles, as I recall. And anyway... I did, I did see recently that she had passed away rather young at only age 49. I did not read the follow-up book that she wrote. It did not get the strongest of reviews. And so I just have that one book in my memory and I did see the movie as well. Question two is, do you notice food descriptions in books and why or why not? Well, yes, I do because I love food. I love to eat. I love snacks and desserts, especially. And what I notice in is whether or not the people in the book actually do eat. This is one of my book pet peeves, and maybe it's a trope, I don't know. But when people don't eat, like, it, and it happens a lot in mysteries and detective books and uh, any book where somebody's, like, really stressed out and going through an ordeal and it'll say, suddenly... I realized how hungry I was and that I hadn't eaten since two days before when we got the telegram. And I'm thinking, who, who does that? Who completely forgets to eat for two days? It would have to be a pretty hardcore emergency before I would do that. But that happens all the time. I do like when they describe food, though. Even if it's food that I wouldn't eat, I like... I. I like that part. I I like the description. It's part of the texture of, of the novel or whatever it is that I'm reading is what the food was like. And 
it's also a lot of times a backdrop to an important scene or a conversation. So I like that in books. Question three is what book have you read that had the best food descriptions? Well, of course I'm blanking out entirely and I'm only remembering the most recent book that had a memorable food description. I know there's been a million books with good food descriptions and they are just scattering to the farthest corners of my mind. But last night I read a really funny food description in, of all places, David Copperfield. And this was a scene where David, who was very young, I think he's still about 17 or 18 at this point in the story, and he's kind of living in his little apartment by himself. He's so excited about these rooms that he has and his little apprentice job. And he invites a few friends over and he tries to have a little dinner party. But some things go wrong. There's a lady that cooks for him and he has sweet talked her into cooking some fish that she, she didn't want to cook fish. And then he has, that's the first course. And then there's some other food that is supposed to follow. But things go wrong. And I'm just going to share with you a little passage. And if you're bored about this, you can skip ahead to the next question. But this is, this is what happened. I suppose, I never ventured to inquire, but I suppose that Mrs. Krupp, after frying the soles, was taken ill because we broke down at that point. The leg of mutton came up very red within and very pale without. Besides having a foreign substance of a gritty nature sprinkled over it as if it had had a fall into the ashes in that remarkable kitchen fireplace. But we were not in a condition to judge of this fact from the appearance of the gravy, for as much as the young gal had dropped it all upon the stairs, where it remained, by the by, in a long train until it was worn out. Okay, that cracks me up so much. Like the, the gravy, they can see the trail of it and how it's dwindling till it gets to the bottom of the stairs. The pigeon pie was not bad, but it was a delusive pie. You know, I have had those. Have you had a delusive pie? Listen, the crust being like a disappointing head, phrenologically speaking, full of lumps and bumps with nothing particular underneath. In short, the banquet was such a failure that I should have been quite unhappy. Um, so the pie, the delusive pie that is all looks promising as it's all lumpy, like there's something good and then there's nothing in it. Um, I have had that a number of times. It's, it's a, it's a tragic instance, but that, I just thought that was so funny. And who among us has not had a disastrous uh, dinner occasion? Have you ever been inspired by a book, not a cookbook, to prepare a specific food or meal? All right, so I I thought about this question a little bit. I don't think that I have been inspired directly by something in a book to go ahead and then make that meal. But instead, I'm going to do one of my favorite things to do in a tag, which is completely alter the question to suit my own purposes. And I'm going to tell you instead about a time when I was just inspired by a book that was about someone being inspired to make something from a book. Does that make sense? It's, I'm, I'm going meta here on, on, on the situation. So when I was a kid, this was a book that I really loved, George Washington's Breakfast by Jean Fritz. And this is a story about a little boy whose name is George Washington something. He has a different last name. George Washington Allen, who was born on February 22nd, like George Washington. So he is a big fan of reading historical biographies of George Washington. This book was written in 1969. It is pretty old fashioned and is definitely a sanitized version of the details of George Washington's home life. There are no slaves depicted in this story. The little boy has read all about George Washington, but there's something on his mind and he would like to know what George Washington had for breakfast. And he's, his grandmother says if he figures out what it was, she will make it for him. So then he goes, so really this turns out to be a book all about doing research and about not giving up till you find the answer. So obviously my dear little nerdy heart way back in first grade knew that she would become a librarian one day. So look at this excellent library picture. I mean, okay, first of all, check it out. Look 
at this stylish 1969 librarian. Look at this kid in the back snooping, trying to eavesdrop. And then on the next page, it gets even better. They're, they're in the card catalog. I love this so much. So the librarian gets all excited and gets in on the hunt to find out what George Washington had for breakfast. And they don't, they don't um, settle for the easy answer. They find an entry in a book that talks about typical breakfasts of the day, but they're like, but the kid is says no, that that does. George Washington was not the typical person of the day. What did he have for breakfast? And the hunt goes on. They go on a trip to, I think they go to Mount Vernon. So at, he does eventually. I'm gonna do a spoiler. He does eventually find out in a in a book what he had for breakfast and it it says breakfast about seven o'clock um was three small hoe cakes and as many dishes of tea now here's where you can no longer read this book to a group of children today because then it goes on and on about hoe cakes and about how do you, what is a hoe cake how do you make a hoe cake well you have to make it with a hoe did George Washington have a hoe in his kitchen? And so at this point, unless you're talking to kids that are like six years old and younger, you probably can't read this book. But um, it stuck with me. And I know why now, because I needed it for this tag. So that was George Washington's Breakfast by Jean Fritz. Do you have a favorite cookbook? Well, I have a current favorite. I have a bunch of cookbooks that I really like. And I even have one I got for Christmas that we're having a lot of fun with. But my current favorite one that I'm using the most right now, and you know, I'm kind of fickle. I'll I'll get really into one cookbook and use it a lot, and then I'll sort of rotate and get into something else. But I really love this cookbook, which is it doesn't have a cover like a dust jacket, but it's Isa Does It. Amazing easy, wildly delicious vegan recipes every day of the week by Isa Chandra Moskowitz. And I have a couple other of her cookbooks as well. And this cookbook has beautiful photographs. This is something, I made this a couple nights ago. Pesto cauliflower pasta with breaded tofu. The pictures are beautiful. The, the narrative style of the recipes is light and funny. And the ingredient lists are not too ridiculous. They don't have too many, uh, they don't have a lot of specialty products. You can get mostly anything at a regular grocery store. Now I have a little story about how I came to own this cookbook. So gather around the fire, because here comes another story. Um, so it, this story begins in the spring of 2020. <laughs> So right when the libraries were going to close and before the library or I knew that they would come up with a curbside checkout service, but just when they knew they had to shut down, I ran around in a frenzy and I checked out a big old mountain of books. And this was one book that I grabbed because I saw it on a display and I thought, oh, you know, maybe I want to try some recipes while we are all sequestered in the house. And so I checked it out and I kind of fell in love with it. I thought, you know, everything I just told you, it looked so appealing and beautiful and I wanted my own copy. So eventually I had to return it, but then I started trying to keep my eye open for maybe a secondhand copy because it's this big old, heavy, expensive cookbook. But I was thinking to myself, if I don't find one uh, pretty soon, I'm probably just gonna buy this cookbook or ask for it for Christmas. And while I was in this time period and the library had reopened, one day I was in there and in this little corner where they have sort of a rolling library book sale, they had put out a whole cart of cookbooks. And on the cart was my cookbook. And, but the story's still not over because the books on the cart were all $2 each and I didn't have $2. I had just run in to pick up some books and I had no money. So they kindly held it for me till the next day and I came back with my $2 and our relationship has been wonderful ever since. So that's the story of my favorite cookbook.
Question number six is, if you could share one meal with an author, dead or alive, who would it be? And there are so many good choices to this, but I feel like the very first thing that popped into my head was to go get in a time machine and go back to the, I guess, the early 1800s and have a high tea with Jane Austen and... I, I feel like, first of all, food-wise, it would be safe because we're talking about scones and cakes and Earl Grey tea. I don't know what we're going to talk about, though. That would be the part that makes me nervous. I, maybe she'd have questions for me if she knew I was from the future. I don't know. This question might linger in my memory and, and disturb me for a while. I don't think it was supposed to be a disturbing question. All right. And then... The last question, this one really is a disturbing question. If you had 24 hours to live and you could eat one meal and read one book, what would they be? Okay, really? This, this question, this is the hardest one and it's kind of morbid, but okay, let me think. Um, I think what I would do is, and, and you know, it doesn't have any rules or parameters here. So first of all, I gotta gather my little family. So I got to pick up my husband and my daughter. We're going to go to San Francisco and the time clock hasn't started yet. So the meal is at the Greens restaurant in San Francisco on a Saturday when they have their fixed price uh, dinner. And I don't know what they're going to be having that night, but whatever it is, it's going to be amazing and memorable and it would make a very proper Last Supper. And I guess I'm the only one having my Last Supper, so they they are lucky because they might get to go back and eat there again another time. But I guess I'm done for, so that's what I'm going to have. Whatever they're serving that night, I'm going to be happy with it. But there better be a chocolate dessert. That's all I can think. And for my book, so I would like to think that I would pick something kind of more... Uh, philosophical or thoughtful about life and the meaning and the connections like maybe I'm gonna reread station 11 or I, you know I definitely would pick a reread so I know for sure that I'd enjoy the book but if we're being completely honest we all probably know that I would probably read Capture in the Rye again one more time and he's got to come into every tag so Capture in the Rye I'd probably bring them both and then I'd have to play the mood or see if I could cheat and somehow squeeze them both in in the time frame before I shuffled off the mortal coil. So that's my best answer I can give for that. All right, the last question is about tagging some friends, but I talked about that at the beginning. If you have not done this and you have a channel, especially you newbies that haven't done very many tag videos yet, try this one out because it's really fun. I hope you enjoyed this. Please tell me in the comments if you agree or disagree with some of my answers or what you would do instead. And I will be back soon for Friday Reads. Bye-bye.